I, I didn't actually realise there were going to be so many computer scientists here, so this is wonderful, um, because um, we're, we're, we're going off into a bit more of computer science now. It's going to be a very, very different talk to, to what you've just seen. Um, but what I thought I would do um, is to, to take us up through one of the, the particular branches of, of privacy from the technological side of things. Now, Runa from the Tor Project is going to be here at some point this week, and she's going to focus on the more sort of communication end of, of privacy, which which I would have been very happy to, to focus on. Um, but I'm going to focus on another side. So just what is privacy? I mean, this is a good place to start. But um, one of the things that I often say when I'm talking to people who are relatively new in the field of privacy is don't try and define privacy, because you'll spend your whole PhD or your whole life trying to do it. Um, so we're going to work with you know, a sort of working definition of privacy that's quite useful in computer science. So there's many definitions from, from different areas. There's, there's legal definitions of privacy. There's sort of regulatory understandings of privacy. Um, a useful definition which, which kind of goes across a number of the barriers is this informational self-determination. Now, informational self-determination comes from the idea um, of German uh, constitutional law. Um, and the idea here is that it enables data subjects to control how, in what way, and to whom their data is made available. So it, it's, almost, it's almost an idea of, of, of focusing on the idea that the data is yours if it's about you, and how you can control that, and how you can limit access to it. Um, but if we're going to consider the, the privacy enhancing technologies community, the pets community, um, we can look at, at um, two, two, different, two different main branches. Now, these have been relatively separate up, up till recently, but they're coming closer and closer together now. So one of these is to protect the relationship between people who are communicating. So this is what is sometimes referred to as contextual privacy, and this falls under the realm of anonymous communications. Now, I can see a couple of, well, at least one Tor sticker around the room. So this is what, this is what Tor is very good for doing. Tor is, is a technology that is designed to allow you to visit a website without the website learning that it's you, or without anyone who is watching the connection learning that you are visiting that website. So this is sort of anonymity for your, for your connections. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm sure Runa will do very well with that. Um, what I'm going to talk about more is um, the data level of privacy, which is preventing people from being identified or, um, or their attributes from being identified from collections of data. So the, the techniques, the underlying things that you do in these two fields are surprisingly similar when you, when you drill down to the very abstract version of them. Um, but up until quite recently, it's been, a, it's been quite a separate um, uh, field of research. Um, they're coming closer and closer together now, but, but until recently they've been different. So if we're interested in protecting data subjects from identification, um, we're usually going to be talking about databases or an abstraction of databases where we have some information on people and we're going to do some sort of processing on, the, on that data. We're going to focus here on um, statistical queries in databases. And so this is things like counts. How many people are there in the database? Averages. What's the average height of the people in the, the database that we're looking at? And things like histograms where you break down um, the people into certain categories. Um, so, to give ourselves an abstract model to work from, we can consider a database as being made up from a number of rows. Um, each row in the database represents an individual in that database, and the columns show their attributes. Um, this isn't a sort of perfect description of every potential type of database, but it gives us a good, a good way of working with it, it's very, and it's sufficiently general for what we're going to talk about today. So, this is a model database of the sort of thing we might be looking at. Um, so, we've got um, some random stranger called Joss, who happens to be 31 years old and 168 centimeters tall. Um, talk on privacy, this is perfectly accurate data, I can tell you that. Um, I didn't put weight in, don't worry. Um, uh, Alice is uh, 30 years old, 144 centimeters tall. Bob is 25 years old and 200 centimeters tall. So the people in this database, or the people who are going to interact with this kind of model that we're looking at, we can break these down into a, a number of different parties. They're the data subjects. This is Joss, Alice, and Bob in the example we just saw. And these are people that own the data. Um, these are the people about whom the data is gathered. 
Um, we've got the people who hold the data and who publish the data. So this is potentially saying the, uh, the database owner, the person that is storing the database and potentially handling queries for that database. And then we've got the recipients of the data, the people who are going to access the database to perform some kind of analysis on it or who are going to sort of maybe look at a website with that data on it. And from a, an adversarial, from a computer security viewpoint, this last one we're going to look at as, as our attacker. This is the person who's going to do nasty things that we don't want them to do. Um, so just briefly to talk about trust. Um, trust is something that is often expressed as a good thing. You know, we like trust. Trust is a nice thing. But to some extent, when you're talking about computer security, what you're trying to do is reduce trust. You know, you want to, you want to trust a system, but you don't want to trust people within the system. So we want to place trust in the, the functioning of the system, that it is behaving um, according to how we want it to behave. Or rather, as I would prefer to say, we trust maths and not people. Um, in this system, subjects, the data subjects, the people about whom the data is gathered, we don't need to trust them because it's their data to some extent. We're not going to try and protect people from violating their own privacy. So this is a first goal. Publishers, though they may need to be trusted in how they gather the data, um, and if you expect them to control the release of the data, you have to trust them to some extent because they need to look after the data, they need to protect it securely and prevent hackers from breaking into the database, whatever. Um, but our main focus here is that we do not want to trust the recipients of the data to do nice things with the data. We want these people to be adversarial, we want them to be malicious, we want them to be nasty, we want them to be, um, you know, all the horrible things that we don't like. Um, so it's the people who are accessing the database that we are working against in this system. We want them to be able to access the database, but we don't want them to be able to find out private data about the individuals who, um, who have the data <coughs> in the database. So how can we do this? Um, well, the first answer is that we can anonymize the data. We can remove explicit identifiers such as names. We can take the Joss and the Alice and the Bob out of the database. Um, and this is something that you see a lot when you get uh, sort of census data or data about people and the company will say, we've anonymized it. We've taken the names out of it. Um, Another way that we can do this is we can, Im um, we can enforce privacy-preserving data mining, which is we're going to query the database, we're going to analyze the database, we're going to do something with the database, but we are going to restrict the queries that can be made on the database, or indeed the results. Um, and this is preferably enforced by the person who is holding the data, the data publisher. Um, another thing we can do is we can perturb the data, um, which basically means we're going to add some noise to the data. We're going to change the values in the database so that um, the individual privacy of the people whose data is in the database is preserved. Now, the first of these, anonymization, um, is going to be a bit of the focus of what we're going to talk about for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, the first thing you do is you remove the names or obvious identifiers from the database. If there's a photo of you in the database, you can take out the photo. If there's a name, you can take out the name. But the trouble arises with this definition um, is when we come across these things called quasi-identifiers. Now, what these are, are they are combinations of records. Hello? Oh, sorry. So, anonymizing data. Um, the first thing that we can do when we anonymize data is to remove people's names from the database. We can say, we don't know who the people are in this database because we don't know their names. But what happens next is we get these things that we can call quasi-identifiers. And what these are are combinations of values in the database um, that allow us to uniquely identify people. Um, these can be difficult to detect. They can even be difficult to, to specify what they do. Um, and this can be made worse by the fact that we might combine databases. We might put two databases together. Or we might combine a database with some other external information outside of the database. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But for a first example, here is anonymization. Here is a database with a number of people in it. Um, and the first thing that we do is we anonymize it by removing the names. So all the names have disappeared. And what we've just got left is a set of ages and heights. But when we look at this, what we find is that only one person in the database is 25 years old. And only one person in the database has height 144 centimeters, or 200 centimeters, or 187 centimeters. So if you learn that the person you're talking about 
has any of these attributes, if they're 200 centimetres tall, you know that you're talking about a single person in the database. They're the only person who could possibly um, fit that criteria. What gets even more complicated are when you combine identifiers together. These are what we would call quasi-identifiers. Only Joss in this database is both 31 years old and 168 centimetres tall. That's a unique entry in the database. Only David is 30 years old and 168 centimetres tall. So what these allow us to do is to uniquely identify any individual in the database by learning their age and their height, for example. Now, in order to counteract this, um, there is a very well-known method called k-anonymity. Now, what k-anonymity provides us is the idea that for every record in a database, for every person in a database, it must be um, the same as 1 minus k other records in the database. So if you have a set of values, if you have a particular description in that database, and we want k anonymity of, say, 5, then there must be four other records in the database that match that description in the database. Um, and therefore, if you learn that set of databases, you know you're talking about one of five people. So the way that we can do this is we just group values together. So rather than for, you know, age being given exactly like it is in this database that allows us to uniquely identify people, we group the values together so that we still have some information about what age they are or what height they are, but we've, we've removed the unique identification here. So what we have here is a k-anonymity of two because the smallest group we have here are Bob and Charles who are both greater than 180 centimetres tall. <clears throat> Now, this isn't something that's hypothetical. This isn't a, a, an abstract academic concept. This was demonstrated by the person who first proposed k-anonymity, Latanya Sweeney. Um, she took postcode, date of birth, and sex from a public um, voter register in the US, and she took a set of anonymized medical records, and she identified the individual record belonging to a former governor of Massachusetts. I'll go into this detail in more example. Um, I'll go into this example in more detail later. Um, but what k-anonymity gives you, it gives you a first approach to anonymization. It gives you a basic level that stops it from being an easy job of just looking up who somebody is in a database. There are more subtle issues against which it doesn't protect, um, and the most important of these is that we can still infer sensitive information about a person. Um, so we have this idea of something called L-diversity. And if we extend this database to perhaps be a little bit more sensitive, if we now include illnesses, then what we have in our very simple database is a relatively uh, sort of innocuous, uh, that's a bad word for an illness, a relatively, um, relatively insensitive or, or not particularly worrying illness and a very sensitive illness that people might want to protect. If we apply the k-anonymity scenario that we've just um, talked about, now we can't identify any individual from this database. If we learn that somebody is between 25 and 35 years old and they're taller than 180 centimeters, we don't know if it's Bob or Charles. But if we're looking at this database, we know that they've got HIV because they're the only entries in the database that match that. So L-diversity um, is an extension of k-anonymity that says we need to also mess up any other sensitive records in the database that might be uh, worrying for people to find out. And these are the examples, HIV, both Bob and Charles. And what we do here, again, is we just increase the size of the group so that everyone is together. So if we learn anything about anyone, this database is now useless, by the way, um, to, to a large extent. Um, but if we learn anything about an individual, we know that they either have flu or HIV. That's all we have. I mean, we can still learn the um, distributions, but that's it. So L-diversity ensures not only that everyone is anonymous in the database, not only that we can't identify an individual, but also that we can't identify a sensitive attribute about that individual. Now, there are other variations that, that extend this even further, but I think what you might get a sense of here is that this is a bit of an arms race, is that you know, we can anonymize people, but then we can find sensitive information. And then we come up with a better way to make the, the sensitive information more hidden, but then somebody comes up with a more intelligent way of looking at the database. One of the examples that takes this a bit more to its extreme is this idea of what's called T-closeness. And what that says is, even if we've got 
uh, a set of attributes across the database, we need to ensure that the groups have the same distribution, the same probability distribution of a particular attribute turning up. Um, but I'm not going to keep going down this, this path because it's, it's, uh, it's a sort of roadway to nowhere, really. Um, so all of the things we've just looked at, k-anonymity, l-diversity, t-closeness, they maintain the consistency of the database to some extent. They maintain the original values. Even if we group them together, we've maintained what was already in the database. But another thing that we can do is to perturb the data in the database. We can add random noise according to an appropriate distribution. And what that means is, for example, if somebody's height is 180 centimetres, we can add a bit of random noise and say, OK, we're now going to say your height is 180 centimetres plus or minus 5. So let's say your height is now stored in the database as 178 centimetres. And what this does is it breaks the linkage between the exact values that correspond to a person and uh, the value that we now store in the database. Um, this is easiest for numerical data. This is easiest for data like heights. It's more difficult for things like illnesses. Um, but what it does is it breaks up these categories. It breaks up these groups of individuals. Another thing you can do is simply to swap the data values that correspond to an individual. You can say, um, we know that there are this number of people in the database that have a height of 180 centimetres, but we'll swap them all around so that Joss has now got a height of 200 centimetres and Alice has got a height of, of 175 centimetres, so that you don't know which one links up to which person, even though the values are still um, accurate. The trouble with this is that it's very difficult to do that automatically. It's very difficult to do it intelligently. So you have to do this on an ad hoc basis, on a per database basis. Um, and it can still reveal sensitive information if you don't do it um, cleverly. So where, did, where does this sort of stuff gone wrong in the past? Well, to go back to Sweeney's example, in 2001, <coughs> Sweeney had come up with this idea of k-anonymity, and she wanted it to be um, popularized. She wanted people to know about her research. So she searched around for something where it would actually work. And she took a publicly ava available database of voter registration database um, and also the health records of local government officials which were published anonymized. They, the sensitive information was removed, the identifying information was removed, and it was published. So she had voter registration and she had health care records. Now, at the time of this, uh, William Weld was the governor of Massachusetts. But according to the voter records, there were only six people in Cambridge, Massachusetts that shared his birth date. Of those six people, three of them were male, and only one of them lived within his zip code. So even though the name had been removed from, uh, it, sorry, even though the, um, the, the database was very large, she could identify him according to a quasi-identifier. There was the combination of birth date, zip code and sex were enough to, um, to uniquely identify this person. And this allowed her to combine it with the healthcare database and identify him, which contained over 100 attributes about his healthcare background, <coughs> including diagnoses, procedures he'd undergone, and the medications that he was taking. I don't think it was particularly um, sensitive in his case. I don't think she even publicized it very, very much. But she did very publicly present him with a copy of his healthcare record, which was entirely retrieved from public data that had been ostensibly anonymized. From this example, Sweeney calculated that 87% of US citizens were uniquely identifiable through the quasi-identifier of sex, date of birth, and the zip code. That goes down to 53% if you don't have the zip code, but you have the city. And that's 18% of people are unique according to their sex, date of birth, and the county in the US in which they live. Um, now, the interesting aside to this, which I haven't put into the slides, is that there was a legislative response to this. There was a, there was a, a, a big concern, this is a problem. So what did they do? They defined sex, date of birth, and five-digit zip as sensitive information that you weren't allowed to share, which entirely missed the point of what was, what was going on here. But that was, that was the response. Now, a, a more sort of up-to-date example is Netflix. Everyone familiar with Netflix? It's an online film rental um, uh, site. But it recommends you films based on what you've already watched. This is exactly the same as, as, say, Amazon recommending you books. Now, what Netflix did was they published, openly, um, a database of 100 million film ratings 
by roughly 500,000 uh, Netflix subscribers between the, dates of, between the years of 1999 and 2005. And they said, if anyone can improve on our rating algorithm by a certain percentage, I think it was 10%, if you can make your, your recommend, recommendations 10% more accurate than the results we already get, then we'll give you a million dollars. And this became quite a craze. There were a lot of people that got, well, you can understand, a million dollars to play around with algorithms. Who wouldn't go for that? Um, but one of the things they said was that all customer, customer identifying information has been removed. Now, this is a very dangerous thing to say um, in the privacy uh, community. But two researchers um, at the University of, I think, Austin, Texas, um, disagreed, um, Narayanan and Shmatikov. Uh, and what they did was they set to look at this database not to improve the ratings algorithm, but to re-identify the users in the database. They said, there's so much information here, surely we can find out who these people are. So what they did was they took the ratings that were published in the Netflix ratings, and they linked them to IMDb profiles. Now, IMDb is a film um, database on the internet. It's got information about any film out there. But you can also have profiles where you can talk about films, what you liked, what you didn't like. So they linked the Netflix ratings to the IMDb profiles, which um, shows the viewing history of users. And they managed to re-identify a significant number of the people there. But more importantly, they demonstrated how that information could map onto things such as political preference. So if you watch a particular type of film, if you like a particular type of a particular genre, then you can discover information about people such as the parties that they're likely to vote for, and also things such as sexuality and other, other sensitive attributes. Um, they developed this into a proof of concept algorithm that used um, the database um, available at IMDB user profiles. However, one of the things that they make a, a point of saying is that it's easily adaptable um, to include other sources. The results that they were getting were that with eight film ratings, 96% um, of subscribers are unique within the Netflix database. So eight is not a lot of film ratings. The interesting thing about this, this figure of eight film ratings was that even if they misidentified two of them, so even if they had um, eight film ratings, two of which had been misidentified by their algorithm, this, they were still getting this 96% um, unique identification rate. If you've only got two ratings from the Netflix database, but you've also got the dates at which those ratings were given, um, then you can de-anonymize 64% de of people. So two ratings and the dates on which those dates on um, which those ratings were given. Um, if you've got two ratings and dates, 89% of people can be reduced to a possible eight users. So this is the size of people you get down to, even if you can't uniquely identify somebody. You're still talking about only eight eight potential users. And if we think back to the the definition of say T closeness, if you're looking at perhaps political preference or something like that, then this allows you to identify certain attributes about people by combining it with other data sources. So what did Netflix do as a response to this? Well, they announced a second Netflix prize containing more data points including age, zip code, gender and previously chosen films. Their response was this wasn't a problem. I, in fact, I don't even really know what their response was because, because as far as I can tell, this was the most aggressive ignoring of, of a problem that I've, that I've seen. Um, and and to, 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 to specifically include things like zip, zip code and gender is, is, is baffling to me. But um, they wanted to improve their rating algorithm. They were going to put up another million dollars to do it. Um, Interestingly enough, from this entire competition, the people that got the fame were obviously uh, Naraya Shmatikov and his co-author, um, who... who uh, Why is Shmatikov easier to pronounce than Naraya? <laughs> well, um, but, yeah, so I, the, this, the, the first prize was eventually won, um, but in the end they had to cancel the second one because there, there was a lawsuit brought that said, look, this has been demonstrated to be a privacy risk. This is not something we can let you do again. So, <clears throat> we've seen that, uh, mechanisms like k-anonymity, we've seen the problems of anonymizing data. Um, so we're going to revisit those now. The things that we've looked at so far tend to be quite ad hoc. We have a database, we want to do something with it, and we try and come up with some algorithm or some clever way of anonymizing the, the data. But this doesn't give us any kind of a formal guarantee. It doesn't say, 
there is a 1% probability that if you have access to this database that you will be able to identify someone. We don't get that kind of guarantee at the mechanism level. Um, the other thing that happens with these is that because they're designed around the database and what's in the database, um, they don't really take into account auxiliary information, information that comes from other sources or other databases. Another way of looking at the mechanisms that we've seen are that we can, we can, we can divide them into non-interactive and interactive mechanisms. Now, the ones that we've looked at so far have been non-interactive. We've got a database, we do something to it, and then we publish it to the world. We say, look, here's the data, we've anonymized it, do with it what you will. So there's no interaction between the, the person that holds the data and the people who are accessing the data. You, know, you could upload it to BitTorrent, and whatever, people can still use it. A second way of, doing, um, of achieving these kind of goals are to keep the database a secret and only allow people to query the database in a certain way. So we don't say, here is the database, perform any analysis you like. You say, I have a database. Here is a description of the data that is in it. Here are the fields. You know, it has age and height and things like that. Um, but if you want to perform a query, then send me the query and I'll send you back the result. So we've got this interactive approach to, to accessing data. Um, the non-interactive <coughs> way is the traditional way. Um, it's the way that has generally been done because it's, the, it's, to some extent, the natural way of doing it. But the trouble with it is that because we've got the data and we know what's there, we've got to somehow fix the utility. We've got to say, this is what you can do with the data or this is what you can't do with the data. And what the, the sort of real result of this is that if you really want to anonymize data, you have to take everything out. You know, like I showed you with the early, um, the, the early K anonymity and L diversity examples, we've got, to, we've got to sort of mess up the values in the database to such an extent that they're completely useless if we want to stop anybody from identifying people in the database. So we either get useless and anonymous data or useful and identifiable data. And it's difficult to predict what you can do with this. So in interactive mechanisms, we never release the data. So people can't really do bad things with it, except through us as a gateway. So to send queries to the holder of the database, we can take uh, this approach, which is the current state of the art, which is the subject of an incredible amount of research at the moment, and completely turned this field on its head um, about, about 10 years ago now, um, is differential privacy. This is also one of the more tricky ideas to get your head around that I've come across in computer science. So I'm, I'm sorry for what's about to happen. Um, <laughs> hopefully I'll explain it well, but um, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in, in 1978, uh, a statistical database researcher um, said that there was a desirable property for privacy preserving statistical databases. And this property was that a statistical database should reveal nothing about an individual that could not be learned without access to the database. So the idea here is that if something bad happens because you access the database, it could have happened even if you didn't access the database. There's nothing in this database that is harmful. There is nothing in this database that you can use to harm someone that wasn't out there already. That's the idea that is being put across here. Now, the trouble with this definition is that it's impossible. Um, and a lot, for, to a large extent, this is because of this idea of auxiliary information that I've been talking about, that there are, there are other pieces of information out there that can be combined with the data in the database. A researcher at Microsoft Research called Cynthia Dwork came up with a very useful, um, a very useful little story, um, which I will read to you. Um, suppose one's height were considered a sensitive piece of information, and that revealing the height of an individual were a privacy breach. If we assume that a database yields the average heights of women across different nationalities, an adversary who has access to the statistical database and also a piece of auxiliary information, which is that Terry Gross is two inches shorter than the average Lithuanian woman, learns Terry Gross's height while, only learning, uh, while anyone learning only the auxiliary information without access to the average heights learns relatively little. So the idea is that you know um, that Terry Gross is two inches shorter than the average Lithuanian woman. But you don't know what the average Lithuanian woman's height is. So you don't learn anything. You learn that Terry Gross is two inches shorter than somebody or some group of people. 
But now if you have access to this statistical database, which may not contain Terry Gross's information, it doesn't have to contain the information about her individually, it just contains the information about Lithuanian women in general. By accessing this database, you learn the average height, you learn that Terry Gross is two inches shorter than that, and you've learned her height. So this is a very difficult property to, to, uh, to control. As I've said critically, this occurs whether or not her data is in the database. It doesn't matter if she was in the database or not. Um, you learn the average height. It's an average over an entire population. It's not going to be changed very much by an individual. So what differential privacy does is it turns this idea on its head to some extent. And what it says is that by living up to the property of differential privacy, anything that can happen if your data is in a particular database could have happened even if your data weren't in the database. So the database is pure and friendly and privacy enhancing. Um, and anything that could have happened by accessing the database came from auxiliary information that is already floating out around there, which is none of our concern. So the database is not the cause of a privacy breach. What this does is it means that any auxiliary information available now or in the future cannot harm people based on the contents of the database. This doesn't prevent a privacy breach. This prevents a privacy breach caused by access to a given database. That's a bit of a weird idea. Does everyone? I've tried to say it in many ways, but there's lots of frowns around the room. So. Uh, quick question. Yep. It seems as though your privacy could be compromised by data in the database. Okay, so if your data isn't in the database, yeah. aren't in the database, then it is quite reasonable that your privacy could be removed by that. You could be identified by data in the database even on the basis of publicly observable characteristics of you, even if your data weren't in that. So if, for example, I have a, everyone in the world, and everyone in the world who has one blue eye and one green eye has got HIV, mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not in that database, but I've got one blue eye and one green eye, yep. then to with an arbitrarily high degree of precision, you can anticipate that I probably have HIV. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, the... No, that's, that's kind because of... Because it's not precise identification, it is to some degree of precision. Um, to some extent, I think we, we need to sort of... We need to sort of break up the difference between what, what's in the database or what's not in the database in this case. And what you're saying here is that you're inferring from the properties of the database that this is probably true about you. That's not exactly the, the guarantee that we're providing here. What we're saying is that if you have a database of everyone in the world um, with one blue eye and one green eye, um, then the fact that that person is in the database or not does not change the inference that you can draw about them. So to some extent, it's what you're, it's what you're saying. We'll go into what the... the, the, the the differential privacy guarantee gives us exactly in a minute. But um, the idea here really is that any of the databases we've got should reveal generic statistical information about people. And that statistical information should not change any inference that we can draw about a new person, even in combination with auxiliary information. Let's see where this goes. I have an, <clears throat> another question. Can you go back one slide? Would you try to relate it to that? Oh. Yeah, that one with the, the um, height. Um, you say, okay, two slides after that, um, if you can derive information which is not in the database, mm -hmm. um, but he had access to the database, otherwise he, he wouldn't have um, <coughs> the uh, information that Alice is two centimeters smaller than the average this year in a woman, because this information has been derived from the database. You're saying but the average height of, li of the Lithuanian woman? Yeah. Um, so the attacker has access, more or less, or at least the auxiliary information, and therefore it's a transitive relation, and therefore I have access to the database. Uh, so you access the database, you give me the information, which yes. is auxiliary information for me, yes. and then I can use it. But yes. There's information flow. Yes, but this is the, the participation in the database is what's important here, is the fact that... Um, the, uh, the access to the database is not what causes the privacy breach. It is the learning of the auxiliary information in this case. Yeah, but the auxiliary information is derived from the database. I mean, otherwise... The uh, oh, I see what you're saying. You're yeah. saying the average height of, of Lithuanian women is derived from the database. Yeah. Um, to some extent, although what, I think the point that is being made here is that you can learn the average height of a Lithuanian woman 
through other database sources. It's oh, not yeah. the content of the database that we're talking about in this case. Mm -hmm. Right? So, w I, to some extent, I think the information flow you were talking about there is the idea that average height of Lithuanian women can only be learned from the database, no, which isn't the case. But if it, if it were the average height of a Lithuanian woman as measured by this database to which you don't have access, right, then what we have is a pseudo-random variable, namely average heights of Lithuanian women. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is that Terry Gross is precisely two inches shorter than one realization of this pseudo-random variable. And if you look at another database, you'll get another draw from that distribution of average heights of Lithuanian women. Um, and she may be two and a half or three inches shorter or two inches taller. You okay. couldn't know unless you knew that that auxiliary information was the same as the one in the specific information that you had. Which is like what you okay. said before well, about let's, perturbing let's, things. Let's see, where it, let's see where, it, where it goes when we get to the more formal definition. So... Um, so where, what, what, we, um, what we get from this, um, the sort of final point on this slide, is that this, one of the interesting things about this, this particular definition is that we're going to divorce the mechanism itself from the underlying data. What this means is that the, the mechanism we're going to use to preserve privacy does not rely on the specific data. We don't need to look at the database and say, this is what we're going to do. Here is the, the algorithm we're going to generate. It is a generalized mechanism, a, mech a mechanism that just says, it doesn't matter what the underlying data is. We've got a means of preserving people's privacy. So the core of differential privacy A randomized function k achieves epsilon differential privacy if for any two databases, d1 and d2, differing on at most one element, um, and for all possible results from that function on the database. The probability, so let, let me, rather than going through the formal definition, because I, I think there are people in the room who aren't sort of working in formal computer science. Um, what, this, what this basically says, um, is that the probability of getting a result from a query on one database is almost the same as the probability of getting it from another database, where those databases differ in only one element. So if, we've got, so if we can think about the database that has Terry Gross in it and the database that does not have Terry Gross in it, if we make a query on the database with her in it, and then we make the same query on the database without her in it, we should get almost exactly the same result. This is roughly what's being said here. Now another way of looking at this by sort of very, very simple rearrangement of the equation is that the ratio between the two probabilities is bounded by this, this very, um, this, this amount here. Now the interesting thing about this is that we can, quant we can parameterize this. So we can say, I want this much privacy. We can make this number bigger or smaller. So we say it's epsilon differential privacy, where epsilon is a value that we choose in order to in order to get the privacy guarantee we want. For those of you who aren't familiar with the exponential function, it looks like this. Um, <laughs> so the idea is that if your epsilon is very, very small, then the probabilities are going to be very, very similar. If the epsilon gets <coughs> larger and larger and larger, then the differences between those probabilities can be higher and higher and higher. So I, I've, already, I've already said this to some extent, but let me say it again in, in words that I wrote down beforehand. For any calculation that you make on a database, any result you get is almost equally probable if you add a person or a single record to the database. Or two, data two databases that differ in a single record should be formally indistinguishable when accessed via the privacy mechanism. So the idea here is that you can't tell the difference between two databases, whether or not they've got one person in them or not. What I'm going to ask at this point is that you just roll with what I've just said. Um, <laughs> Or not, you know, if you want to talk about it a bit more, then, then feel free to ask me questions perhaps at the end. But let's, let's not try and sort of, sort of smash that through our head too much, because I probably would have liked a whole lecture on that on its own. We've got this idea of differential privacy. How do we achieve it? Well, there's a, a few ways that you can do it, but um, the one that was proposed in the original paper is still very, very popular. And the way that you do that is that you add random noise to the result of a query. You don't change the data in the database. You perform a query, and then you add some noise to the, uh, to the result of this database. 
and there is a particular probability distribution called the Laplace distribution, which is very, um, which has some very nice properties for doing this. And this is the Laplace distribution. Um, it's a symmetric distribution, which means it looks it's the same on both sides of, of the uh, of the optima, of the mean even. And um, we can move it around. We can give it a different mean, and we can scale it, which means we can we can make it sort of larger and smaller. The the advantage of the uh, the scaling it means that we can change our privacy guarantee as as in how we desire. We can get more privacy or less privacy, um, and well, I'll leave it at that. How much noise do we add? Well, we use something called the L1 sensitivity of the function. And all this is, it sounds, sounds it's an unnecessarily complicated term if you ask me. It means how much could the query change if we add one single record to the database? Best example here is a count. How many people are there in the database? There's 50 people in the database. If we add one record, there's now 51 people in the database. If we take away one person from the database, there's now 49 people in the database, which means that the L1 sensitivity is 1. The count function can change by 1. Now, there are lots of different types of queries you can perform on a statistical database, but a lot of them have a surprisingly small sensitivity. If you're taking an average, for example, if you're taking an average of heights, people, you know, people in, say, the UK, then the amount of difference in the average that can occur by taking away or adding one person is incredibly small because there's about 65 million people in the UK and any one person's height is not going to change that average by very much. So the sensitivity of the function is correspondingly very low. The proof, there's a proof that the Laplace distribution is um, the optimal way of adding this kind of noise. It adds the minimal amount of noise that still preserves privacy. And the factor in the guarantee that we use, the epsilon, um, is scalable, which gives us higher or lower guarantees of privacy. So we can say, I want this much privacy. And the mechanism can then add that for you at a very basic level. I'll try and explain this a bit more graphically. Mu1 and Mu2, two databases, two sets of possible results from a statistical query. This could be a count or it could be an average, something like that. Now, the idea here is that this is, say, your real result. So, sorry. Um, this is the, the true average in the database. This is the true result. And if we have a particular result B for the particular results of a particular query, then this fits into both of the two potential databases. This describes the database with one person in it. This describes the database without that person involved in, um, in the results. What this means is that if you get this result, it could still be within the bounds of probability for either of the two databases that we're talking about. And this little arrow here says there is a difference, there is a ratio between these two probabilities. Another result, it's a lot smaller, it's a lot further away, but it's still within the bounds of probabilities for the two different databases that we're talking about. Now, the advantage of this is that we can, we can define this ratio, we can define the difference in probabilities to be anything we want them to be. So, differential privacy gives you really nice privacy guarantees um, that are, as I'm discovering, incredibly difficult to explain to an audience. Um, they're also neatly composable in two senses. One of the nice things that you get from differential privacy is that um, you, can give a rain, you can give a series of queries. Rather than saying, I want the average or I want the count, you can say, I want you to count up the number of people in the database, divide it by two, perform an average on those, and then sort them out into histograms for me. And then it's only the final result that needs to have the noise added. So you don't need to add noise for every single query you want to do, which means that you don't get extra inaccuracies in your results over the course of the, over the, course of the queries that you're performing. Um, another thing that's nice about this is that for every query you perform on a differentially private um, database, you exhaust a certain amount of what they call the privacy budget. So those probabilities, the probability that you get a particular result, if you perform that result again and again and again, if you ask for the average and they add some noise, if you keep asking for the average again and again and again, eventually, because of the law of averages, you will converge on the real value. What differential privacy gives you is what they call a budget, whereby you can say, once this certain number of queries have been performed, there's no privacy left in the database. You actually have a quantifiable amount of privacy. And you say, 
there's no more privacy left in the database, we can destroy it. Now, this is actually quite useful in some senses, but quite terrible in others, because if you've just spent several million pounds gathering the UK census database, somebody comes along and performs 10 database queries on it, and all of a sudden your, your um, tech people say, great, we had privacy, now we need to destroy the UK census database, then you've got a, a bit of a problem here. But what this allows is that you can say, beyond this point, we only have this privacy guarantee. Beyond this point, there is a higher probability that people could be identified as a result of, th of the data stored in this database. Practically speaking, this is all very um, theoretical, um, but we don't want people who, are, who own the database to understand the theory that underlies this. Um, so what some researchers at Microsoft Research did was they wrote a query language. Now, anyone who's done any sort of database um, work will be familiar with SQL. Um, what uh, this project produced was a version of SQL that automatically enforces these privacy guarantees. So one of the things that this demonstrates is not just the fact that this is a practical guarantee that can be given on databases, but that you can use it without having any understanding of the underlying mechanism, which is probably a good thing given the, uh, given the uh, time I just spent trying to explain it. Um, PINK, um, which is Privacy Integrated Queries, the name of this database tool, is um, something that's out there. It's been used in academic analyses. I haven't seen anyone using it commercially yet, but it is, it's directly out there. If you go and look for PINQ on the Microsoft um, Research website, you'll find it, you can download it, and you can very easily perform queries on a database and demonstrate how these privacy guarantees play out in the real world. A more practical example um, is related to smart grids, um, which are the uh, the sort of proposed um, uh, at the European level, I think certainly at the UK level, um, that uh, we should have smart meters in our homes for our electricity supri supplies that will measure the, um, the electricity usage, which allows us to have smart billing, very fine-grained billing systems so that every, say, 15 minutes or so, um, you get a different uh, billing amount based on the amount of electricity that you've, that you've used. And this raises some, some serious privacy concerns because there have been various people who have demonstrated that you can work out what people are doing at various times of the day based on the electricity usage, such as the moment where you switch on your <coughs> Xbox, the moment where you make a cup of tea, the moment where you get up in the morning, all these things. Um, recent work by uh, another Microsoft researcher called George Denesis has demonstrated the use of differential privacy in the billing systems so that it preserves the privacy of the actions that you take over the course of the day. And the way that he does this is by adding, in exactly the same way we just saw, adding noise to the bill. Now, noise in a bill, unfortunately, comes in the form of money. Um, so what you do is you add, you know, if, if, the, uh, if the bill for the 15-minute period you've just, um, you've just seen uh, is £2 for your electricity, you can say, well, I'm actually going to pay £2.10. Um, George uh, Denesis, who, who did this work, sort of changed the definition slightly so that you only add money, you can't take away money, unfortunately, to gain your privacy. Um, but this is, something that, this is something that's been demonstrated and that works and that can be used to preserve the privacy of electric smart meter reading. Um, it gets very, very expensive very, very quickly to preserve your privacy. Um, and what was found in this paper very, very quickly was that the best thing for you to do beyond a certain point is to just say, I'm going to pay the maximum possible amount for every period um, because that preserves my privacy. I could have been using as much electricity as possible in that time. Um, but it is something that has been demonstrated and something that, that would work in practice um, for certain privacy guarantees. Sorry, in that case, why would I care about preserving my privacy? The nearest thing it does is to keep me locked to my current provider. Because in which case? In, in the case of the smart meter, because my, the information about my electricity use potentially is of more value to my current provider than it is to me, because it prevents rivals from crafting a competitive offer and taking me off the hands of my current supplier. OK. I mean, so it, it should clearly depend on what use you're going to make of that information as to who should pay. Uh, well, I mean, the, I think the basic idea for this one is that you don't want your electricity company from knowing your daily habits. Oh, so this is something that stops 
my current provider. It stops your current provider. It stops your current provider from learning the fine-grained details of your of your billing over the course of a day. Oh, okay. And, and from that, so anyone else as well, not just the current provider. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so. yes yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And so it's also the stuff that the UK government is going to be feeding out to all of us with this your data. Thing. I imagine it could well be. Um, there's. Yeah, I think the, the trouble that you get particularly with this is that the, um, the understanding of privacy at the, um, at the sort of policy level still tends to be very much at the kind of k-anonymity stage of yeah. things. You know, we're going to cut the names off this and then that will be, pr will be private we're going, without sort of much of an understanding of the, the inferences that can be drawn from the, uh, from the data. Yeah, because um, I guess in this case, if, if, it, if it was exactly as you say, that it's my generator who needs to be stopped from learning my habits, I will have a very easy to quantify notion of what I can lose if they do learn my habits and charge me accordingly. Um, I wouldn't say you had an easy to quantify notion of what you can lose. I would say you have an easy to quantify notion of how much you're willing to pay to preserve what you view as your privacy. <clears throat> no, that's in my observed behavior. What I mean is, if I have the choice to pay the maximum yep. or not, I'll say, suppose they did know. I know, yeah, yeah. because I can see my smart yes, 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 yes. I know my detailed thing. I know yep. what optimal pricing by them will cost me. Yes. And that's the upper limit on what I should be willing to pay. Including your privacy guarantee or not? Well, I mean, why do I care about my privacy guarantee? Because it saves me money on my electricity. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. I'd, why, why do you care about your privacy guarantee? It's because you care about your privacy guarantee. This is not. This is not from the. This is not from the point of view of an actor who is who is trying to save money from their provider by. It's not privacy in the sense of I'm trying to save money from my provider by hiding the details of my electricity usage. This is the privacy of somebody saying oh, so I this, don't want this the electricity. Really abstract thing. It was not purely abstract, but this is somebody who is saying I don't want my electricity to provider to know um, at what time I turn on the kettle, at what time I play Xbox, at what time I change channels on my TV. Or what this is this is the the value of privacy as as a value as opposed to an economic incentive. In fact, this is an economic yeah. disincentive because you have to pay yeah. for your privacy. Well, I mean, lots of the things in the UK, they're pushing the smart meter to be a hub for lots of things, not only your yeah. provider. So if you think about yeah. it, don't talk about electricity provider, but talk about it to potentially any other source as well. This is the backwoodsman electricity user. Yeah, but even so, right, if I've got these smart devices, why would I not program those smart devices to generate little random spikes of utilization and say, go ahead, find out my detailed electricity use much good may it do you. It's not me. It's some machine that I've. The, the spike. So well, I mean, to some to some extent, that is what this is doing. It is. It will. It's adding to your bill a certain amount of of. It, it, to some extent, it is <laughs> reporting via your bill a certain amount of random noise in your data, um, which yeah. is which which they will interpret as a spike in your electricity usage. However. Um, Randomness by itself does not necessarily give you the, the property that you want. This is this is a more sort of this is a more sort of formalized guarantee of what is the minimum amount of noise that you need to add that guarantees a certain quantifiable level of privacy. So to some extent, this is exactly what you're saying. It is yeah. random spikes added to your noise. It doesn't correspond to your real data. How about if you if you told your ISP that you were using vast volumes of data one minute before their acceptable use policy kicks in in the afternoon? Yep. Yeah. Out okay. of spite. But the the advantage of this is that it was designed in such a way that you can't end up paying less because it was it was pretty obvious that the electricity company would not allow you to save money and get your privacy at the same time. Yeah, so. which which is why I thought if you created an avatar between you and them, let that avatar's privacy be compromised all to hell. Well, and sit behind yeah, yeah. it with your own thing where you don't that, have to pay for that, right? So all I'm doing is adjusting the timing of when my washing machine switches on. Right. To to yeah to some extent that's that that's what that's what's happening. Although obviously in this case there are there are certain extra constraints in that the devices have to be sort of verifiable to the to the yeah. to the to the electricity provider so that you can say no I definitely did use this amount of electricity I'm not scamming you I'm not doing X yeah. Y and Z so there's a lot of details in this particular in this particular work. Um, but yeah, the basic goal is this allows you to pay a certain amount of money to preserve your privacy from your electricity provider. 
Um, so where is this going in the, in the future? Um, what's the current research? Well, it's a very, very strong guarantee. In fact, it's too strong to some extent. It, it, it can destroy the utility of data um, for practical real world purposes because you have to add so much noise to get these quantifiable guarantees. So there is some work into how can you weaken this, this guarantee in such a way that you can you can you can still understand how much privacy you're losing, but you can um, still do useful things with the data. Um, there are ways uh, discussions about how to how this fits into distributed settings, where you, for example, have multiple data sources over multiple places that you want to um, aggregate together and add noise in the most optimal way. Um, and also the data, to some extent, um, the original differential privacy guarantee was based around static data in a static database, you know, such as, say, the UK census database from 2001. Um, you, know, you can apply differential privacy to that, um, but that, that data doesn't tend to change over time. Whereas when you're talking about things like, for example, smart grids, um, there are questions about how you would give these guarantees over, over streaming and changing data. Um, so. Stepping back from differential privacy itself, um, just to say the lessons that you can take away from this are that anonymizing data is a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and it's only really in the last, I'd say even the last five years or so, that people are starting to realize just how difficult it is at the research level to do this kind of work. Differential privacy and the pink tool that allow you to do this are good <coughs> examples um, of how to go, but they also give very, very strong limitations on what you can potentially do with data while still preserving privacy of the individuals. Um, and the things that we've seen with Netflix and the, um, the Massachusetts example show that these aren't isolated or theoretical examples. These are things that have happened practically in the real world. And when you start thinking about Facebook, Google, Amazon, and all these other companies that are gathering this data and processing it and releasing it in some senses, then um, we, have, you know, <laughs> we have a long way to go. So, um, you know, things that you can say for your, for your own research. If you are in a position where, you're, where you want to anonymize data or you need to anonymize data, it's something you need to think about very, very carefully. Just eyeballing the data and saying, oh, well, you know, take the names off and that's fine, or um, sort of replace the name with a hash of the name, which is something that's still happening quite often, is not a way of anonymizing data. Um, you can do that, you know, I don't mind, but don't claim that it's anonymized if you've done it. Um, that, you know... If, if, you, if you do it badly, then that's your own problem. If you do it and say it's anonymized, I'll, I'll hunt you down. Um, and, um, but I would say here that the most important oh. principle, which <laughs> the most important principle um, is one which the privacy by design people will be familiar with, which is data minimization, which is only gather the data that you need. Specify what you want to do beforehand and work out what data you need to do that with a very strong understanding of need as opposed to want. Um, only use the data for what you initially need it for. Don't keep it around and use it for other things because it might be useful. And then only share it when you absolutely need to share it. And I'll leave those as lessons on the board. So, thank you. <coughs> so, untraceability and unlinkability, yes, for example, yeah. is, is, is the more sort of, sort of common term. It's more falling onto the contextual side of privacy, more things <coughs> about using the internet anonymously, using the internet in an untraceable fashion. Yeah. Whereas <coughs> this, this, this definition was work, we were focusing specifically on the database side of things. So you wouldn't get, you wouldn't typically get untraceability in a database. So I mean, say, I could... You say uh, the untraceability term does not apply here for the data product thing? Um, the untraceability term could potentially be something that you could link into these kind of techniques, yeah. but they, they have tended to fall into different realms and you have different goals. But there's no reason at all why you, you couldn't say um, apply a differential privacy guarantee to the records of somebody's web browsing um, in the log files of a computer. They, they, uh, for example, if you have uh, a record of one person, mm -hmm. although you don't know who she is or he is, mm -hmm. but you can trace that person by saying that, yeah, this person having, for example, the HIV, yeah. visited this kind of different websites. Yeah. So it's, I, I can track that person. Yeah. This but is the kind of yeah. violating privacy, so but I don't know the that's, that's, that's true, but that would typically fall under... The, that would typically fall under this kind of database privacy, where you would be more wor you'd be more worried about preserving the the privacy guarantee. Say, a differential privacy guarantee would be likely to give you that that sort of response. But when people talk about unlinkability or untraceability, they're typically talking about traffic analysis. 
Um, so this would be the things that Tor would protect against, or that you know you might use a mixed network to send your emails yeah. and things like that. And that's something that I deliberately didn't focus on in this talk because I think that you'll find Runa will talk about that a, a, um, a bit later on in the week. Yeah. So. Um, well, I found your presentation absolutely stunning. I thought it was an eye opener to me at least. Not dealing with algorithms on a daily basis. Therefore, my question might be silly, but please explain it to me as a um, non algorithm user. Um, I understand that the schemes you described are fit for data that is numerical or verbal, so that is information that is with numbers, that's linked with numbers, or with certain features. Yeah. Um, are there any mechanisms for anonymizing, preserving the privacy when it comes to face recognition, imagery, Google Street View, etc., etc.? Um, so, numerical data is the easiest thing to deal with, obviously, because yeah. we have nice mechanisms for it. When you're talking about uh, things like face recognition, there are more direct. Um, there are more direct approaches that are often that are often used. Um, for example, Google Street View with their fuzzing of the faces. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the the interesting thing with Google Street View is that, in terms of the model that we're working with here, is that Google Street View doesn't need faces in it. So, if you want to preserve the privacy of individuals in Google Street View, ideally, what you, to, you what you want to do is just cut out the individuals. You know, um, so. That, that's the sort of thing I would actually be focusing more on a data minimization issue, which is that, you know, we don't want these people to be there but shift their identity. We want to take them out. But then you go to cars parked outside yeah. houses of, well, yeah. not your wife, this type of thing, because there yeah. was a case where a guy was parking the car outside his yes. friend's house yeah. that was not so, really his wife. So the car is enough. Yeah, in, in, terms of, in, terms of, in terms of generalizable... Um, information uh, or generalizable mechanisms, let's say, I wouldn't be able to apply something like differential privacy or even k-anonymity or something like that to Google Street View. Um, that's that's typical. That's a very um, it's a very sort of specific example. But again, I would ex if if I had to sort of theoretically explain you know a privacy mechanism for Google Street View, I would say take out everything except the streets. So, I'm thinking also about pictures on Facebook with faces yeah, being yeah. blurred until you agree for your face to appear, but yeah. then there are different elements in the pictures that would also be auxiliary information. Well, I, like absolutely, that, absolutely, and this sort of, to some extent, this to some extent is a good demonstration of the difference between utility and privacy, in the fact that um, if you wanted a very strongly privacy-preserving mechanism for the Facebook face blurring example, you would pretty much have to blur the entire photo That's what it until is. until everyone in that photo okay. agreed. And then what Facebook would say is, you're destroying our business model. Exactly. And I would say, good. Um, <laughs> but so this model wouldn't work for imagery, that's what you're saying, but... Well, I mean, you, blurring a photo is, is, is equivalent, really. You know, you, you, you blur the photo in a, in a particular way, but there's no way, of, there's no way of giving a photo that somehow takes out, you know, everything that could potentially link to an individual, but only leave in the other individuals, because the fact that there are other individuals there is already a is already a privacy breach because you know if I if it's if it's a photo of my family and you take out me but it's obviously my mother and father and two brothers um, and my wife yeah. you know and and there's just this blur with its arm around my <laughs> wife then there's a good chance that it's going to be me um, I hope um, so um, so yeah I, it's more difficult at that level of, of privacy mm -hmm. um, yeah. two questions. Uh, during your presentation, I sometimes ask myself to whom he's talking to. I mean, this presentation and these um, techniques are um, addressed to researchers that has to anonymize their um, data set to whom okay. you are talking to, because probably the lessons, the empirical <laughs> test you, uh, you you might gather might be different depending on on the, the subject that I have. So. To some extent, this, I mean, the, the purpose of this talk was to give an idea of what is the, what is the current state of the art in privacy-preserving mechanisms. Okay. So, the, so mm -hmm. you know, that's... that's because so I'm talking, to, I'm talking to you. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, so, no, because the second question I have is about, for example, open data. Yep. When you talk about open data and from a public administration point of view, for yep. example, would that technique, uh, the data minimization, the K anonymity, whatever, yep. would be a suitable uh, standard for them 
because privacy for <coughs> privacy for uh, public administration is especially they, they care too much about that so they yeah. may uh, uh, resist the yeah so I mean this is this is a very sort of it's a very important question actually mm -hmm. um, this <laughs> particular set of mechanisms has come out of the privacy community where privacy is the goal unto mm -hmm. itself so this is more of a representation of we have a strong guarantee of privacy, what else can we do? Whereas when you're talking about public administration, when you're talking about open data, it's a question of we need to live in the real world mm -hmm. and we have to balance various rights against each other. Um, the, the kind of guarantees that I would largely talk about here are for situations where you have quite a restricted source of data, you particularly have it gathered. You could use this, for example, you know, you've all just filled in a survey this is the kind of thing that might be very useful for pulling out, you know, statistical aggregates mm -hmm. from your surveys. You know, what was the age of the people in this room without potentially revealing any information about an individual. <laughs> if you're talking about open data and sharing data, if you want to do something with the data, if you want to have a certain set of utilities for the data, particularly if you're talking about general utility, which is where you say, I'm going to throw this data out there and I want somebody to be able to do traffic flow management with it and somebody else to be able to do uh, demographic surveys with it, then these kind of guarantees will break that utility because they're so strict and they're so strong. And to some extent, that's where a lot of the research is now. In a practical sort of policy sense, the, the guarantees of privacy that you can give are so low that they're almost meaningless in the formal sense. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, so I would say that something like K-anonymity or some of the more advanced versions of K-anonymity I showed are useful <coughs> first guidelines with the, with the acceptance that you say this does not provide any form of guarantee. This is our best effort at preventing a harmful re-identification from the data we have released. And these are the techniques that we can use to do it. And these are the um, attacks against which we are defending the data. Um, when it comes to something like differential privacy, that would be more for sort of internal databases that you have a certain amount of control over and you want to perform quite restricted, um, say, statistical analyses for. So what I would say here is that there, is, there has to be a balance, and the balance in terms of usefulness usually results in there will be a privacy issue from this data, but we've just done everything we can not to make it a really harmful one. Um, that's the real world. So. Oh. I just uh, had a comment, I guess, when you said, you know, trust maths, not people. Um, I mean, I can see how, you know, obviously if you want to be able to formally prove things, it makes a yeah. lot of sense. And it makes a lot of sense, you know, if you're working on, like, in the scope of the databases or whatever. Uh, a lot of work we've been doing has been on, like, sort of changing, pro like, dealing with privacy by, like, dealing with access controls, changing that runtime, these sort of things. Mm -hmm. And you can actually find the formal models, even though you can prove things correctly, the maths not, might not account oh. for anything. So, for an example, we're doing some stuff in healthcare. And it was like, um, basically, doctors will get certain rights when they're, you know, performing yeah, yeah. a procedure or whatever. But the thing is, in the real world, things go wrong. Yeah. yeah. And so you need to be able to sort yeah. of get away. Well, from I mean, that one of sometimes. So formal. yeah, no, that's absolutely. So just that's mean, absolutely be careful true. when you. No, so well, out well that actually, there's in know. in a sense, there's 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 three points that come out of that. One is that yeah, the real world and formal models don't mix very well. Um, the other one is that any formal model and any formal proof of a formal model is dependent upon the assumptions that you make when you make that model, which is kind of the same as the first point. But what tends to happen with, with these kind of proofs and formal guarantees, particularly in security, is you say, I assume that this person is going to behave in this way, and this person is going to behave in this way, and nobody's going to drop a wire into the computer and read off the voltage on the processor when it's doing something. And if I make all of these assumptions, then my security proof is correct and no one can break it. And what happens then is that five months later a hacker comes forward and says but you didn't think of this and your your whole proof is broken um, but what dif so with those caveats what differential privacy does quite nicely is it very strictly limits its model to something that is quite practical in the in the, in mm, practical in the real world sense which is that the database owner keeps the data and there is a, as a sort of restricted sort of flow of information between the two of them having said that there has been work published on breaking differential privacy because what they did was I shouldn't really go into this in too great detail but what they did was they sent off a query to the database and they said give me the number of people in the database 
Um, but if the real answer is, but but wait, five hundred seconds or how can I put it? Give me a count of the database, and for that count, wait that number of seconds before you send back the noisy result. So what happened was, you sent off your result, there's 500 people in the database, and it, after 500 seconds, it sends you back a result of 500 plus or minus 20, but it waited 500 seconds to do it. And so the, what they did was they came up with a, a side, it's called a side channel or a covert channel attack. And so if there's 510 people, it waits 510 seconds. And so what this did was exactly what you just said. It broke this, this model, it broke these, this set of assumptions about, about how you can perform these kind of queries. And that sort of thing does break. But yeah, this is very, it's a very strong guarantee, but a formal proof is never more than formal. Which like means it's not real just world. in practice, you get higher and higher yeah, and higher yeah, yeah, levels. And, yeah. so then it and particularly if you're talking about access world, control and, 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 yeah, and, 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 you know, it's not, so. and passwords stuck to monitors and stuff yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. then yeah, there's problems. So. Um, do you use the K-anonymity model and the other models the other way around as well? Because now they're being used to guarantee certain privacy preserving issues, but could you use them to evaluate um, existing databases to look at how on privacy preserving they are? You can you, you could use them as say a metric. You could use them as you know you could use them as a measure of, <coughs> of you know this database is out there and we can see that it has this certain level of K anonymity. It's actually surprisingly tricky um, to work with quasi identifiers because if you've got a database with a million entries and a hundred attributes, then trying to find you know, each unique combination in that database is actually very, very intensive. So you could potentially do it, but this is one of the reasons why it's very difficult to, to get this kind of guarantee. Um, and constructing databases to meet a K anonymity guarantee are quite, are quite tricky as well. So you, I think the, the K anonymity falls, or, or the things based on K anonymity, they fall into quite a useful rule of thumb approach to privacy. They're not going to give you a guarantee. You are going to get priv big privacy breaches. You are going to get um, problems. You're going to get you know, all these issues that are going to come out there. But maybe you're going to get a few less than if you just did no anonymization. Or if your idea of anonymization was, you know, very famously AOL released their mm. query database um, f f f quite a few years ago now. And all they did was they sort of struck off the IP address of the computer, or they hashed the IP address of the computer that was making it. And, you know, hashes have particular properties that, you know, you can certainly match a hash of an IP address to, a, to um, another IP address. But it was looking at the query results that they, I that, was it the New York Times? Some, they identified um, an individual, her name, and went and interviewed her and, and you know, this was one of the first cases where this came to the forefront. So it's a useful first step. And I'm, you know, I was very dismissive of the fact that you know, the, the legal response to the anonymity example was to make sex, postcode, and date of birth sensitive information. But there are worse things they could have done. For example, what Netflix did and completely ignore it and give people more data. So, um, yeah. Um. One of the things that strikes me is there's an interesting notion between this absolute sense of identification and what a statistician would regard as identification. In other words, if you can identify me to within five people, mm -hmm. or you can say that I've identified you with the probability of yep. X, that clearly for some purposes may be sufficient for you, but not for me. So if I'm publicly releasing a database, based not on the idea that it would facilitate something that addressed me directly, but that it would say something useful on mm -hmm. the basis of the data that were in there. Why wouldn't I simply redraw the data using the joint distribution implied by the data that were in the actual database? Release that, there's no privacy implication whatsoever. Redraw because it's the, the affiliations the among the field. No, but what matter. you've done there is you've specified your utility beforehand. You've said this is what I'm going. This is what I want to know about the data. This is what I'm. No, going no. To I'm just saying whatever you want to know that is encapsulated within the joint distribution of those data is legitimate. Anything else is not. So here's the joint distribution. In this redrawn. To to I mean to some extent it sounds like what you've just done is is describe T closeness. Um, which is, but, but, so what, I don't know, I don't quite understand what you mean when you say redraw according to the, 
Oh, as, so, as in you mean yeah, draw randomly mean, from the distribution of these variables? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, and you if, can. If yeah, you yeah, have, but, you've, you, but yeah. what you've done there is you've perturbed the data. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. So, so absolutely. yeah, this is a perturbation because example. Because there is a legitimate interest in the distribution of the data, and certainly yeah. for like marketing and so on purposes. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But and I mean, what I'm saying is, well, for, for a start, for a start, yeah. you need to you need to create, you need to accurately model the joint distribution of the data, which is possible, but yeah. Expensive. Secondly, this is a pet this is perturbation. This is you've you've randomised the data, which means that the, the the data is no longer what it originally was because you've just drawn according to a database, which means that you've added noise to your data. Well, it was already it was already randomly drawn when you observed it, except under very exceptional circumstances. Yeah, exactly. But you've drawn right. a, you've drawn you've made a different random. Well, I hope yeah. you made a different random draw. <laughs> um, but. Yes, yeah, so you can do that, but so what you've done effectively is you've added noise to your database, yeah. which is exactly what differential yeah. privacy does, yeah. but it does it optimally, and that's that's very important. Is that it 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 adds the minimum amount of noise that meets the privacy guarantee that it claims to live up to. Well, I was just the question I was asking was whether optimization on the basis of individual queries and individual entities was optimal in the sense of the use that's made of the database as a whole. Um, well, obviously. it's opti it's optimal in the case of. For a, for a particular statistical query, the, yeah, that yeah. query is made according to the minimal amount of noise that, is, that needs to be drawn. But the advantage of the, of the differential privacy guarantee is that the database remains um, accurate at the core, and it's the query results that are perturbed. Yeah, but okay. Then no, and, and the yeah, advantage right. of the advantage yeah. of that comes in the composability of queries, where you can make uh, you can make a linked series of queries that all occur on the server, and it's only the final result that gets perturbed, which is nice. But that would be true if you just redrew it. I mean, coming back to the point about, for example, if you redrew it once and then worked yeah, from right. that, then yeah, and, and worked from that, that became your sample population, yeah, yeah. as it were, yes, which is different between, let's say, econometricians and statisticians yeah. in that respect. But there's also the thing about if you limit if the number of people in the database is much larger than the number of records, I was thinking about the mm -hmm. Netflix thing. If I didn't do all my business with Netflix, yeah. I'd be much less likely to be uh, caught unless Netflix could somehow combine its data with all my other providers. So it is a danger of monopoly, um. which suggests that mixing people up in that way could be useful. Anyway, that, that, the, the last thing I um, wanted to mention was this yeah. continuity property. Because it seems a lot like a continuity property, for example, is phrased that if you make one addition, yep. the things don't change grossly. Mm -hmm. If I asked, for example, for the median, the number of people having exactly the median height, and yep. I go from odd to even in the database, with arbitrarily high probability, I go from zero to at least one. Uh, you... Just by adding one person. Say because it's not a yeah, but the result will problem. be randomized. Yes. yes. So, so but it's randomized between zero and one, right? It's got to be zero or one. Right. So yeah. I don't get the. So that means you're either giving me a completely random answer. It has nothing to do with the data in the database. Uh, uh, it's just that I was just pointing out. That oh, the, you mean the number the of people that are the, the number of people that are at the medium of, yeah. median of the database? Yeah. yeah, but again, the the point is that if the if the sensitivity of the query is if it's zero or one, yeah. then the result will still be randomized according to zero or one. So what you might end up with is a completely useless yeah, yeah, query. Yeah, exactly. But that's what, that's the point is that the query becomes useless uh, based on the privacy okay, guarantee right, that yeah. you have. So it's so, costly in one or the other of the sense. <laughs> it's 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 costly in the sense of it will. It, in the sense of your your query, it doesn't guarantee that your query is going to be useful. It guarantees that your query is going to be privacy preserving. So, okay. Thank you.